when we think about the presidency, um, either in 1789 or in 2020, I really see the presidency as being made up of three elements. One are the social interactions. The president is sort of a figurehead and a social representation of the nation in a way that no other figure can be because the president is the only person that represents all Americans. The second part is how the executive branch, led by the president, of course, interacts with the other branches of government. And then the third is how does the president actually lead the executive branch itself? And we're going to touch on each of those three a little bit. Of course, we can't get into too much detail in the 30 minutes, but always happy to answer questions and talk later if there's something in particular that you want to know more about. So one of the things that I think is so important to stress when we talk about Washington's presidency is when he took the oath of office on April 30th, there was so much that was unknown and so much that had been undecided. I really encourage students and audience members of all ages to look at Article 2, which of course defined the presidency, and to pay attention to how short it is. There's so little actually written down that is supposed to help the president figure out how he's going to deal with things on a day-to-day -day way. And so Washington was left to fill in those fuzzy details and figure out what it meant to actually govern as president, which was a huge task. And one that he wrote about as though he was going to, and he was the, a prisoner going to the place of execution. So he understood the enormous pressure that was on his shoulders and that every step was potentially going to set precedent for his successors. So he really started with the social interactions. That was the first part of the presidency that he tried to figure out. And he sent letters to a bunch of his different advisors, including the vice president, John Adams, the eventual chief justice, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, asking them what they thought the best way would be for him to see friends, to host people at his home, to attend different events. And eventually he came up with a series of almost like a pyramid of social events and ways that he could be available to the American people. The president's house first in New York City and then in Philadelphia was an incredibly large and grand residence. Um, the house in Philadelphia pictured here was one of the largest homes. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, so I have uh, recreated it in 3D so you can see what it looked like, see sort of the haphazard way in which it was put together. Um, but I think it also just provides a little bit more depth for our understanding. And at this home, Washington hosted open houses on New Year's Day and on July 4th, where he literally opened the doors to pretty much everyone and served punch and some food and thousands of people smushed into the hallways and into the public rooms of the house while parades and military bands went by on the street and fireworks and cannons were shot off. So obviously you weren't gonna have a whole lot of, you know, quality one-on-one -on -one time with the president, but it was at least a way that you could say that you had been to his house. The next level were his Tuesday afternoon levies. And these were basically open to any man with a good set of clothes. Now, what this meant really was probably any white man with a good suit, but any, any white man could show up, could be introduced to the president. The president would walk around in a circle and say a few words to each person, and then the event would be over. So again, not exactly high quality conversation, but it was one-on-one -on -one access to the president in a way that was really important and that hadn't been available to, for example, the British king. So the next level down were Martha Washington's Friday afternoon drawing rooms. This is sort of a fanciful depiction. I don't think they actually looked like this, but it's nice to have an image because we don't always have that when we're talking about the 1790s. And these events were really critical because both men and women were invited. And because women were there, they were technically semi-private, semi-public events, meaning they were not political because of course, if women were there, people weren't talking about politics. That's obviously complete hogwash. And of course, politics were discussed, but women sort of gave the event like this veil of secrecy. And because Martha was the official host, Washington was able to be there and to interact as though he was any other private citizen. And he took full advantage of this opportunity. In fact, in the spring of 1790, at one of Martha's drawing rooms, 
he actually went up to a couple of senators and sort of tried to convince them to vote a certain way on a bill, which they did end up doing so. And it wasn't considered improper politicking because women were present and Martha was the host. So that's just um, obviously a very different way than we think about social gatherings today, but was a very important part of their social scene. Then on Thursday evenings, Washington held state dinners. This is a recreation of what his table would have looked like. That's actually at Mount Vernon's museum, including these same chairs, the same china, the same table decorations. And the dinners would have been anywhere from 10 to 20 people. They would have included um, Supreme Court justices, congressmen, senators, visiting dignitaries, local elite families, and often the department secretaries that were a part of Washington's administration. Then the final thing that Washington had to think about was what happened when he left the house. Now, of course, he was going to see people and he couldn't pretend that they weren't there, nor did he wish to. But trying to figure out what was the right balance between sort of elite and average behavior was really hard because he wanted to be basically fancy enough to earn the respect of foreign ministers that were coming from places like France and Great Britain and were used to behavior at Versailles in the court of St. James. Yet he didn't wanna be so ostentatious that his own citizens felt like he was trying to be kingly. So he came up with a series of compromises. The first of which was transportation. This is um, a, a similar type of coach, except that Washington's would have been cream colored with gold trim. The enslaved men that he had to drive and tend to the carriage had matching uniforms. And anyone who has ever had a white car knows what happens when you take a white vehicle outside in bad weather, especially when there wasn't pavement or proper sewage systems. So the cream coach demonstrated um, his wealth and the fact that he could uh, basically own and, and pay for enough enslaved labor to clean the carriage every time he used it. It was incredibly recognizable, pretty much the fanciest coach in all of North America. So it definitely made a statement. But then on the other hand, every afternoon, first in New York City and then in Philadelphia, Washington took a walk. And he didn't do this to go from point A to point B because he really preferred to ride on horseback or to use the carriage. And if he was going to exercise, riding was his preferred way to do so. He took walks because it was a way to demonstrate that his boots got dirty too, just like any other citizens. And it was his way of saying like, I'm just a, an average man. Now that might seem kind of silly to us today, but his contemporaries understood the symbolic importance of that decision and that action, and they really appreciated it. Similarly, when he got dressed for important occasions like his inauguration, he wore a fancy homespun suit. So he was the first president to rock American uh, made attire to his inauguration. Granted, it was a very nice homespun, but still it was American homespun. It wasn't French silk or English wool, but he did like some finery. So he also had diamond shoe buckles. So it was, again, it was that way to have that balance. The second key part was trying to figure out what the relationship was going to be between the presidency and Congress in particular. The Supreme Court was still kind of coming into its own and didn't have that same sort of contentious relationship. But the balance of power between the executive and the legislature was really undefined and unclear. Washington started that process in the summer of 1789. Article two of the Constitution, a phrase I'm sure you're all familiar with, says that the president with the advice and consent of the Senate will make treaties and foreign appointments. And at the time, that advice part was taken very seriously. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention assumed and um, basically insisted that the Senate would serve as a council of foreign affairs. The Senate was only 24 people in the fall of 1789. They were indirectly elected from the state legislatures, so they were safe advisors because they could be removed if they gave bad advice. And the delegates assumed that the states would choose wise and knowledgeable and experienced men that would provide excellent advice for the president. And this was Washington's expectation as well, because of course he had been at the Constitutional Convention and had heard all these conversations. So 
The first issue of foreign policy came up in the summer of 1789. And he said, okay, time to go visit the Senate. It was an issue about a peace delegation between representatives from the federal government, North Carolina, South Carolina, and the Creek and Cherokee nations. And so he sent to the Senate all existing treaties with Native American nations, um, just so that they would have all the background information. He met with a committee so that he could plan where he would stand and where he would sit and how he would enter and how he would be introduced. The sort of details that kind of seem silly until you actually have to do them for the first time and then you realize how many of these decisions really need to be made. And then on the day of his visit, he brought with him the acting secretary of war, Henry Knox, who had overseen all of these treaties and could answer any questions or provide any additional information that maybe the Senate would need. When he arrived, Washington had a dress and a list of questions for the Senate to consider, to debate, and to hopefully provide feedback on. And when the address was delivered, he was expecting that they would, you know, start debating and start discussing these issues. And instead, he was met with silence. Some of the senators maybe shuffled papers or twiddled their thumbs or basically avoided eye contact, and it must have been an incredibly uncomfortable couple of minutes of silence. So eventually, Senator William McClay stood up and suggested that they refer the issue to committee so that they could discuss it privately, and would Washington come back the following week for their recommendation. Now, Washington was usually known for his composure until he wasn't, and in this moment, he absolutely lost his temper and he stood up and he yelled, this defeats every purpose of my being here, except taller and louder and bigger and scarier because this was like pretty much the most famous man in the world and he was furious at you. And so the senators were quite shocked and stunned into silence. Washington did calm down and he agreed to come back the following week. But on the way out, he reportedly said that he would never again return for advice. And while the evidence is a little sketchy about whether or not he actually said that, he certainly was thinking it because he never again returned for advice. So right away, a key part of the Senate's role as the advisors to the president on foreign policy, Washington dismissed as inefficient and not likely to work when actually faced with real challenges in the day-to-day -day governing. So there are a couple of examples where Washington is trying to figure out how he is actually going to interact with Congress going forward and also the state governments, because keep in mind, of course, this is a time when the state governments are very jealous over their own authority. Um, the left is the proclamation of neutrality that Washington issued in 1793 when France had declared war on Great Britain and had spiraled into an international conflict. And Washington and his administration had to figure out how to stay out of it. The right is a picture from the Whiskey Rebellion when rebels in Western Pennsylvania had burned down the home of a tax collector over a whiskey excise tax. And Washington and the administration again had to figure out how to deal with this crisis. Both of these incidents were unprecedented and the government had and the presidency especially had never dealt with that type of crisis before. And they serve sort of as um, two different sides to the same coin. One, the first, the neutrality crisis was the foreign policy side and the whiskey rebellion was the domestic policy side. And Washington and the cabinet were basically faced with a couple of questions. First, would they leave it to Congress to decide because Congress was in theory supposed to be the most powerful branch of government? Would they convene an emergency session of Congress if they felt like maybe things had to be dealt with right away? Or would they leave it to the states? The last option is, would they carve out additional authority for the president to establish policy, assert that policy, and enforce it either in foreign affairs or in domestic policy? A little bit of a spoiler alert, in both cases, they decided that the president was the person who had the best potential to lead the nation effectively and strongly. And so they worked really hard to carve out a sphere of authority over foreign policy and domestic policy and sideline both Congress and the state governments. What's remarkable in both of these instances is that Congress and the states basically let them do it. The second thing that's remarkable is that the cabinet in, in this particular instance 
was not working to expand its own authority. It wasn't going to be more powerful because the president took action in the neutrality crisis or the whiskey rebellion. But instead, the president was going to be more powerful himself or the office was going to be more powerful. So those were two really important moments. And by either not saying anything or agreeing to Washington's policy, Congress established precedent that the president should be the one that was taking action in these um, in both of these instances. I also just want to briefly touch on Jay's treaty and the assertion of executive privilege. I decided not to, in our, our document conversation later, I decided not to include this document, although I will send it to you guys because I think it's one of the funniest and best letters in the history of letters. Um, in 1794, Washington sent Chief Justice John Jay to London to negotiate a new treaty with Great Britain. He received that treaty back in the spring of 1795 and with Edmund Randolph, who was the Secretary of State, decided to convene an emergency session of the Senate to um, review the treaty and hopefully ratify it. The Senate did ratify the treaty and at the end of the summer, Washington decided to sign it and then it was kicked over to the House. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait, I remember the, the clause about treaties in Article 2 and the House isn't anywhere in that clause. And you would be correct, except that one of the clauses in the treaty required the United States government to create a commission to adjudicate pre-war debts, which of course required money. So the House had to pass a bill to create that money. And so the bill went to the House for their, basically for their review. Now, a lot of Republicans in the House really despised the Jay Treaty and were looking for any opportunity to scuttle it. So they put forth a proposal requesting all written papers pertaining to Jay Treaty negotiations, basically hoping to embarrass the Washington administration. Washington met with his cabinet and decided to assert executive privilege for the first time. And that letter is absolutely extraordinary because he basically says, one, um, diplomacy requires secrecy. And so in this instance, I'm not going to share these materials because other nations might not respect our, our ability to keep a secret in the future, and they might not be willing to negotiate with us. However, two, if this was an issue of impeachment, I would waive that right because I think the impeachment bar is higher and so therefore Congress would have a right to those materials. And three, I was at the Constitutional Convention and I remember when these terms were negotiated and I remember when it was decided that the Senate and the President would make treaties and the House was not supposed to have a role. So you are trying to usurp additional authority that was not constitutionally granted to you. And if you doubt my recollection, the journals from the convention are sitting in the Department of State offices and you are welcome to come see them. It's basically like the ultimate 19th century or excuse me, 18th century mic drop. So it's a really fantastic letter and I think students find it really funny. It's also a really important moment because of course it is the first time the president has asserted executive privilege, which we've seen is still an issue in the 21st century. So the last part, the executive branch work environment, which I will confess I am partial to and is my favorite because as Denver pointed out, I have a book on the cabinet and I think it's highly underrated as part of the presidency and perhaps some of the most important aspects. So also in article two, section two, there is a clause that says the president may request written advice from the officers of their particular departments um, about the issues in front of them. And this phrase was, was crafted incredibly carefully. So first of all, the president may require advice. He is not required to, and he's not required to listen to it. And that was really important because it meant that the secretaries couldn't bind the president with their advice. Second, that advice is supposed to be in writing so that there is a paper trail of evidence about who says what and who advocates which position. Again, that's essential because it ensures transparency in the executive branch and makes people take responsibility for their actions. And finally, the department secretaries are supposed to be talking about the things that they know something about. So if they are confirmed as the Secretary of the Treasury because they have fantastic financial knowledge and experience, they probably shouldn't be talking about diplomacy because maybe they don't know as much about that. 
the um, the drafters of the Constitution really wanted the president to have knowledgeable and experienced advisors, and this was the best way they knew how to make sure that happened. So Washington initially did try to use written advice. But as we've often seen in our own communications, whether it be text message or email, sometimes in written word, things aren't conveyed exactly as we intend them. Either the tone is not you know, properly understood, or maybe we forget to say something, or maybe we have a follow-up question. And before we know it, we have a chain of 10 text messages or 10 emails, and it's kind of hard to follow. So now imagine trying to do that with parchment and quill. Not only does it take a really long time because you have to let the ink dry before it can be delivered, but it's cumbersome, it's frustrating, and the issues in front of the president and the departments were very complex and often did require follow-up conversations. And so that's what Washington did. He would start by exchanging a letter or two with the department secretaries and then invite him, one of the secretaries, to his private study, and this is what it looked like, to discuss the issue further and nail, nail down any details or you know, figure out any edits on any particular document. And that worked for about two and a half years. And I emphasize that amount of time, two and a half years before the first cabinet meeting because most people think that the cabinet was there from day one and it was absolutely not. Um, Washington did not intend to create it. Washington did not um, immediately create it. In fact, it took two and a half years before he called the first meeting because he was really trying to stick to the letter of the constitution. And it was only when faced with such big issues that they touched on all of the different departments and he needed multiple perspectives that he actually brought the cabinet together. Um, he held a couple of cabinet meetings in 1791 and 1792, but they really peaked in 1793 when there was the neutrality crisis and Washington had about 51 meetings that year, either that he organized or that he held himself. He convened a number of meetings in 1794 as well to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, and they all took place, or most of them took place, in his private study. Now the space is really important because it's only about 15 by 21 feet wide. So it's a big room, but it's not huge. By 21st century standards, it would have been absolutely stuffed with furniture, which I don't think this picture necessarily shows quite as well as I would like it to. There were at least three mahogany bookcases. The desk in the corner was over five feet wide. There was his uncommon chair and his globe and his dressing table and his mirror. He probably had a small table and chairs brought in for the secretaries when they came to meet with him. And there was an iron stove in the corner that you can't see for heat in the winter. Most of the meetings, the most of the cabinet meetings in, in years like 1793 took place in the summer in Philadelphia, in this room without air conditioning. And the five guys in the cabinet that we saw here were not particularly small gentlemen. Um, so they would have taken up a lot of space. And by that point, Hamilton and Jefferson absolutely despised each other. So you can imagine uh, the tension in this room, what it would have felt like, and um, you would have really been able to cut the atmosphere with a knife because I think it would have just been absolutely dreadful. But the reason that's important is because Jefferson and Hamilton already disagreed with each other on pretty much everything. And we're locked in a room together all the time, up to five times per week, sometimes for several hours per day. They became convinced that the other person was a mortal threat to the future of the nation. And they became convinced that they had to do something about it. So that's when they really started to pick up their organizing of the new or sort of rising political parties. I think that the political parties would have happened either way, but I think being in this room and which was essentially like a hot house for partisan tensions only exacerbated the process. So at the end of 1793, Jefferson retired. At the end of 1794, Knox followed. And then at the end of January, 1795, um, Hamilton also retired. So by the summer of 1795, only Randolph was left of the original secretaries and he left in August. So Washington had a lot of trouble filling those positions. The secretaries were not particularly desirable jobs to have. They weren't paid very much. You had to be away from home for months at a time. 
they you would often meant that you were leaving your primary source of income. So if you weren't independently wealthy, you were going to take an economic hit. Traveling was really uncomfortable, and you opened yourself up to a lot of criticism. So a lot of people didn't want, didn't want to be in the administration. And the people that Washington did eventually get, he really didn't think that they were up to snuff. I affectionately call them the B team, um, but what, for whatever reason, Washington didn't like them or didn't trust them quite as much. So in the final years of his administration, he really only had a couple of cabinet meetings and instead preferred to return to individual one-on-one -on -one consultations or written advice with people outside of the administration that maybe lived elsewhere like Hamilton. So what did that mean? What does that mean for the presidency? What does it mean for the people that followed? First, it meant that the um, institution of the cabinet did not have a right to be a part of the decision-making process. They could offer advice and input when Washington or the president asked for it, but they didn't get to demand that they were heard. Second, it meant that the cabinet was really flexible and what worked for Washington or another president in any given year didn't necessarily work the following year or even the following administration which meant that every president gets to decide for himself and hopefully eventually someday herself who their closest advisors are going to be, how often they're going to talk about issues, whether or not the president is going to listen, what those relationships are going to look like. And there's very little public or congressional oversight of those relationships. But so when we speak broadly about Washington's precedents and the structures that he left for his successors, I think the cabinet is a huge one because he essentially crafted the executive branch from scratch. But when we think about the relationships between the president and the executive branch and the other branches of government, that presidential power over foreign policy and even over the domestic agenda is still very much there. And the president as a social representation of the nation is still something we think about because the president represents the country on a global stage. So what, what the system Washington created, while the particulars might look different, that outline and that scaffolding is still very much with us today.